Hello everyone. The fun has begun. This is the first batch of systems from that massive Franklin e waste haul that we're going to be looking at. And of course I just had to start with the baby ATs. And all except one of these towers has the little 7 segment clock speed display on them, which I absolutely love. So without further ado, let's tear into these. Okay, I'm going to start with this system. I can see it's badged as a 386DX40. Pretty sure it's been upgraded because I'm not convinced that they're using a 50 speed CD drive with a 386. I really can't wait to hear the uh, 50 speed CD-ROM operate because these things made some perfectly terrifying sounds when they're at full speed. And we see it has the uh, seven segment LED display here, two digits. Of course it has the turbo button. Got a reset button here and the lock cylinder for the key lock. And this front panel is in really good condition. There is very little yellowing. I think it's just a little dirty. And having a look around the back, of course we have our AT keyboard port. Looks like we got a uh, PS2 port there. Got some kind of video card. Got a D-Link LAN card and USB. Yeah, there's definitely some signs of uh, some upgrading going on because none of these markings match. I don't see a sound card, so this might have been an all-business machine. And the Novell Netware sticker kind of furthers that suspicion. But let's go ahead and open this thing up. And this opens up just like any other AT system. Slide this back. Yeah, I've got some signs of spider activity. And oh yeah, this thing's been upgraded. We've got a Socket 7 motherboard. So that's going to be either a Pentium 1 or it could also be an AMD K6. So let's go ahead and remove that heatsink and see what kind of CPU we're working with. And yep, that looks like an AMD. Let's get a close look at that. And it is, an AMD K6 II. So this is a Super Socket 7 motherboard. Very cool. Looks like a 500 megahertz version. I used to have this exact same CPU back in the day. All the pins look good. Now that's interesting, it's got a little thermistor there for monitoring the CPU temperature. It's got a little flex cable to keep it in contact with the CPU. I guess that's there for uh, earlier Pentium 1s because I'm pretty sure the AMD K6 II has an internal temperature sensor. At least I can remember back in the day playing Quake in the middle of summertime and uh, getting the temperature alert. The PC speaker would start blaring this siren sound and <laughs> it just sounded terrifying. And of course the system would lock up and then I'd have to wait for the system to cool down. Alright, let's go ahead and get that CPU back in there. That little thermistor applies just enough pressure to kick the CPU out of its socket, so I gotta hold it down while I lock it. Let's go ahead and get the heatsink back on. All right, let's go ahead and get these IDE cables out of the way. Oh no, these are non-keyed cables. All right, let's check out that graphics card. And it is an S3 Verge DX with A-Open stickers. Looks like it has four megabytes of video memory. Let's take a look at the LAN card. And it's a regular old D-Link. Must be the MAC address there. Nice embossed IO shield. And the motherboard has a VIA AGP chipset. Nice disconnect power on that floppy drive. I'm gonna go ahead and remove power from the motherboard. All 
And this motherboard also accepts an ATX power supply. And for RAM, it accepts both DIMM and 72-pin SIM modules. And that bottom DIMM module is almost touching the drive cage there. That is going to be fun to get out. And this drive cage is not removable. This entire thing is riveted in place. But I can at least get the hard drive out of the way. It's like it's just sitting there floating on one screw. <laughs> yeah, that is funny. I only had one screw holding it in. And it is a Western Digital CHS drive. Looks like maybe 8.4 gigabytes. It has a manufacture date of February 14th, 2002. Hey, that's Valentine's Day. Well, I found where they stored the other screw. And got a spare jumper. Now, with that out of the way, let's see if we can get that DIMM module out. Yeah, it comes right in contact with that drive cage. Hmm. How am I going to get that out of there? Do I have to just kind of flex the entire drive cage? This thing was definitely shoehorned. They wanted to get every bit of life out of this AT case. Okay, that was interesting. And the first stick is 64 megs. No indication of what speed it is. Let's check out the other one. That one's much easier to get out. And this one is PC100. Looks like maybe 128 megabytes. All right, let's give that power supply a test. All right, come on, smoke show. Well, the fan is fanning, but it's hitting something. I can't see what. Yeah, I definitely don't see anything that it's hitting, so I'm guessing that the fan bearing is just a little bit out of whack. So let's give it some lateral exercise. And by the way, this is not a good idea to shove a screwdriver into a power supply. Do not try this at home. You will regret it. All right, that should do. All right, that sounds much better. All right, let's try that one more time. All right, I think that's good enough for a test. Okay, we're a little bit low on the 12 volt rail, but it is stable, so we should be fine. Let's go ahead and try our sacrificial hard drive. And it's working just fine. That's its normal death rattle. All right, got the motherboard reconnected. Also put the peripheral cards back in. Power on. All right, we got complaints. Sounds like that CPU fan has seen better days. Let's go ahead and hook up a monitor and see what it's complaining about. All right, monitor's connected. Let's try again. Okay, there's considerably less complaints that time, and it's posting. Okay, well these are pretty reasonable complaints, so let's go ahead and get the drives reconnected. Alright, got all the drives and keyboard connected. Power on. Hard drive sounds decently healthy. Got a floppy drive seek. Okay, I don't know what it's booting, but it's booting something. I think. Doesn't look like it's getting far. If this thing does have Novell Netware on it, I have no clue what to do with it. I have never ever messed with Netware. Alright, well I've given this thing a more than generous amount of time to figure its life out, and it still hasn't done anything, so... Let's try a DOS boot disk. Alright, got a DOS boot disk in. Let's see what it does. Okay, that's weird. some slow beeping. Okay, well, seems to be slow beeping to infinity. And nothing changed, except for inserting the DOS boot disk. So let's do some investigating. 
Okay, well I stripped everything down and couldn't really isolate the problem, so when in doubt, clean up all the edge connectors. Alright, well that did the trick. And it is not happy about that floppy drive. It sounds like that CPU fan is just getting worse and worse. I better give that some attention. Alright, so I'm just gonna cut into the label to get out the bearing. Now I'll just give it a little drop of oil and work that in. Now I'll take up the excess. Let's give it a quick wipe down with some IPA and then I'll seal it up with some Captain tape. There we go. Much better. I can barely hear it now. Okay, yeah, that floppy drive is not having it. And furthermore, it refuses to relinquish my disk. Okay, well, I extracted it and there's something rattling around in there. So let's open this thing up and see what its deal is. All right, well, I found what was rattling. Some spring from somewhere. I'm gonna need my disk back. There we go. Yeah, that mechanism is all sorts of hoopa jooped. But I have no shortage of floppy drives, so I'm just gonna put this on the shelf and repair it at a later date. Alright, I swapped in a known working floppy drive, and it's a near-perfect color match. But you know what? Let's try booting from the hard drive again. An NT loader is missing. Okay, apparently this thing had some flavor of Windows NT on it. Okay, well, in that case, let's try Nopix. That is, assuming the CD-ROM drive opens. And it does not. It's gonna need a little help. Wow, that thing's really stuck. Wow, I've never seen a CD-ROM drive this difficult to open. It is fighting me every step of the way. There we go. Good old Nopix. Let's see if it tolerates 196 megs of RAM. CD drive spun up and got the Nopix splash screen. Let's go ahead and boot. Uh-oh, doesn't look happy. Illegal instruction. Oh, you know what? This might be an i686 kernel. Now, let's see what the chances of me getting my disk back are. Huh, it opened right up. Yeah, <laughs> that opens every time now. I guess that little scuffle was enough to get it unstuck. Okay, I really want to see this machine boot to something, so I downloaded a copy of Nopix 3.8.1. This should have no problem running on this machine, because it should definitely have an i586 kernel. And if this boots, you might hear me weep, because I haven't seen KDE3 in decades. Oh <laughs> wow, I remember that splash screen. Alright, let's go ahead and boot. And Nopix is booting. So we got an ACPI error, but that's no surprise because we're using AT power. All right, we made it to run level five, so I think this is gonna make it to the graphical environment. Yep, starting X11. And there it is. Oh, wow. <laughs> the KDE splash screen. <laughs> it does the uh, bouncy icon thing. KDE 3 does that anytime you open a program. Oh wow, Conqueror. I haven't seen that in forever. <laughs> Alright, well this thing's working. It's gonna open up the terminal.
Okay, I think that hard drive got assigned HDC, so partition should be HDC1. So let's mount it. And it mounted. Let's see. And there's the mount point. And indeed it is. So now I can look at the boot.ini and see what kind of version of Windows is on there. And it is, Windows XP Professional. Now let's see if there's any user data on this. And there is. Just great. Okay, well, I'm gonna be wiping this hard drive. And let's get out of here and unmount it. Oh, look at me. I'm just typing uh, SDC at a muscle memory. This machine has no SCSI emulation whatsoever. Okay, let's do a quick read test of the hard drive. I'm gonna read it into DevNull. This version of DD predates the uh, progress indicator. And I wonder if we have IO top on here. Nope, does not. Okay, I'm just gonna have to wait for a DD to output its completion. Man, I just can't get over seeing KDE3. It's got this ancient version of Firefox on it. <laughs> wow. You know, I'm tempted to connect this thing to the internet. And unfortunately, I did not reinstall the NIC. Okay, well, DD finished up with no IO errors. Let's just confirm that. And yep, kernel output's clean. It's a good sign for the health of this hard drive. All right, let's go ahead and shut this thing down. Oh, wow, the KDE Dragon. Okay, well, apart from some rattly fans and a stubborn floppy and CD drive, this machine is perfectly healthy. I don't want to keep this motherboard in here, though. It's far more appropriate to put something like a 486 in this case. Okay, I just have to see that little display light up, so I'm going to go ahead and run 5 volts to it. <laughs> and there it is. Yeah, <laughs> it works. Now, it's probably not going to get the uh, number switching. No, I'm not without the turbo button actually connected. It's connected to the display, but I guess there is some involvement of the motherboard. But um, normally, when you'd press the turbo button, that would change the numbers. You could either, um, you know, set it to like 33 or 66, so it would be an indicator of the clock speed. And you would set the digits by adjusting that giant array of jumpers on the back. Yeah, I am definitely putting a more appropriate motherboard inside this case. And staying with the vanilla Darth Vader cases. And this has another one of those fake floppy drive covers. I used to get such a kick out of seeing people try to put floppy disks inside those. And we got an 8 speed CD ROM drive. And faintly scribbled on the front there, you can see it's a Mitsumi drive. And this case actually doesn't have a whole lot of yellowing either, except for the uh, underneath of the panel here. And actually, now that I look closer, this still has the protective film over it. You know, that piece of cellophane that everyone loves to peel off. But you know what? I'm gonna leave it on there. Okay, well, not a lot going on in terms of peripheral cards. We just have what looks like a breakout shield for a PS2 connector and parallel port. And of course, the AT keyboard connector. Let's go ahead and open this thing up. Hey, found drive bay cover. And we got another Socket 7 motherboard. And no hard drive. Let's go ahead and get these cables out of the way. And we are fully loaded with 72 pin SIM RAM. Now these SIM slots are the all plastic version, so they're kind of fragile. I'm just gonna very carefully release these tabs. There we go. And the first stick looks like 16 megabytes. Just go ahead and pull those power cables out of there, get them out of the way. And the second stick, also 16 megabytes. And the third stick is also 16 megabytes. And the final stick is also 16 megabytes. We got 64 megs of RAM in this thing. 
Now there's no dim slots, so I'm pretty sure that's a Pentium 1. And while I got the RAM out, I'm just going to go ahead and clean up all the edge connectors because I don't want to have to take all this back out again just for fear of those brittle slots. And unfortunately, this board uses a Dallas real-time clock that's soldered right to the motherboard. Now these devices contain an internal battery, and there's no way to change the battery. So when the battery dies, you have to replace this entire module, which requires desoldering from the motherboard. So let's just hope that battery has just a little bit of juice left. Looks like it has a year code of 1997, so I'm not optimistic about it. All right, well, let's see what kind of CPU we have. This is one funky looking bracket. Let's see how this works. Huh, well, that's convenient. And it is an Intel Pentium 1. And yeah, to those wondering, it is totally normal to not have any thermal grease or thermal pads underneath of ceramic CPUs. You can put it there if you want, but most people didn't back in the day. Just get that heatsink back on. Oh, I love how easy that little bracket is. Oh, I just love that giant heatsink on the voltage regulator. That thing's beefy. And just a quick look at the chipset. You can see it's an A open motherboard. And here's a good look at the BIOS and the keyboard controller chip. All right, let's give that power supply a test. All right, smoke show time. Nope, powered right on. And that fan spun right up. And the sacrificial hard drive is playing us the song of its people. And it looks like that CPU fan's happy. Okay, all the voltages check out, so let's give the motherboard a test. All right, that is a good sign. It's just complaining because it has no video card. So let's go ahead and grab a video card. And Nana's computer provides. This is from a video I did a few weeks ago on a, several systems that I found in the garbage. All right, Nana's video card is in. Monitor's connected. Power on. All right, we've got life. And looks like that Dallas real-time clock is indeed dead. So we may not be getting very far with this one. But it did count the correct amount of RAM, so that's good. Let's go ahead and run the setup. Oh, cool, it's got that GUI BIOS too. Ooh, the monitor is doing some weird things. Okay, well, I don't have much to set up in here, so let's go ahead and connect the floppy drive and see if we can get it past the uh, CMOS error. All right, floppy drive's connected. Got the DOS boot disk in there. Let's see what it does. Okay, yeah, we may not be getting past that CMOS error. Okay, floppy drive's set correctly but I don't think it's gonna let me override. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna have to replace that RTC. Now, I don't have anything on hand to replace that thing with, but for now, that's as far as we're getting with this system. Although the results are encouraging, it does at least post. We do have just a little bit of weirdness on the screen on that character there, but there's no telling what kind of weird faults this thing might have with a bad RTC. So we will investigate that in a future video. But I can at least see if the CD-ROM drive works. And it opens right up. Sounds like it has a gear drive mechanism, so there's no belts to go bad. And this one also has the little display disconnected, so let's go ahead and connect that. And luckily this one has the Molex adapter still in there. So I can just plug it right into the power supply. And there it goes. And of course this motherboard is also too modern for the turbo functionality, so we're not going to get the number switching. And they went ahead and tested this CD and floppy drive on another system, and I confirmed that they do in fact work. Okay, well, partial success on this system. This motherboard will definitely be making another appearance on this channel when I get the replacement RTCs. But again, I don't want to keep this board in this case. This case definitely deserves a 486. But let's go ahead and move on to the next system. All right, the next system is this very sad looking beast. This thing is crusty. Oh, we see it's badged as a 486, so we'll see if that's true. And this uh, floppy drive is pretty stuck. I wonder if it just needs to have a disk in there to trigger a mechanism. Let's see. Oh, indeed it does. Okay, maybe it's not so stuck. It's definitely crusty. Yeah, yeah, there's definitely sticky things in there. And see, we have a quad speed CD drive. It's got a very similar countenance to that last system that we just looked at. 
volume potentiometer is pretty sticky. Oh, I think I just released it. And this one has a keyboard lock right on the front. If you've never seen that before, this actually just disables the keyboard, assuming it's connected to the motherboard. And having a look at the back side, the crustiness continues. So we've got a fair number of peripheral cards, although it doesn't have a sound card. You can see, of course, we have the AT keyboard connection. We've got a game port and serial port. We've got a dial-up modem. It has a NIC. We've got a standard serial and parallel port, and some kind of video card. And weirdly enough, there's a piece of wood shoved inside there. I don't know what that's all about. Now, this case is pretty beat up, so might have a time getting this outer shell off. Oh yeah, that's gonna take some prying. All right, I think I got it. Man, oh man, this thing is filthy. Okay, that's weird. They've got a um, edge connector adapter on the floppy drive. Uh, three and a half inch floppy drive. It's very strange. And that CD-ROM drive is connected directly to the I.O. board, so it's definitely an IDE drive. Let's just go ahead and start getting these cables out of here. Oh man, look at that dust. And look at that, this is actually a VLB board. Very cool. And we might be in trouble. It's got one of those notoriously leaky NICAD batteries in there. Now at this age, those batteries will leak their electrolyte, and that substance is corrosive, and I can already tell we have some corrosion. So we might be doing a board level repair on this. All right, let's go ahead and get that video card out of there. And it is a 16-bit ISA Trident card. Date stamped 1991. Well, at least the backside's clean. The game port runs to the I.O. board. Let's go ahead and get that out of there. Disconnect the hard drive LED. Careful to note the polarity. And it's an enhanced IDE I.O. board. Love these high-vis jumpers. And has an ISA NIC. Don't know what that chipset is. Looks like this thing's gotten pretty warm at some point. What is on the other side of that? The crystal? That's weird. Why on earth would the crystal get hot? Okay, well that's strange. All right, let's check out that dial-up modem. And it is. U.S. Robotics. No indication of the speed of it. I'm guessing at this age it could be 14.4. Uh, All right, let's check out that CPU. Yeah, this heatsink's not easy to get off. And it is Intel 486DX2 in a non-ZIF socket. I'm just gonna leave this heatsink off because it needs to be cleaned badly. I can already hear the bearing rattling. Okay, I've got to get this motherboard completely out because I need to assess the damage from that leaky battery. So let's get this hard drive out of here. Looks like I can just pull this tab. It slides right off. Oh, that's convenient. Wow, that is an old boy. Western Digital Caviar, 341 megabytes. Obviously a CHS drive. Let's go ahead and unplug that. I still can't figure out what's going on with this wood here. It is screwed to the case. Why Why would somebody do that? I'm gonna need to go ahead and unscrew that because that's gonna interfere with the motherboard removal. Okay, it's one chunk out of there. Why? I need to know why. Let's get that power supply disconnected. Unfortunately, that escaped the corrosion. And I'm gonna have to remove this breakout shield. And oh yeah, look at the corrosion on that ISA slot. This motherboard definitely needs our help. Let's get that crusty CPU fan out of there. Now I gotta get a real good shot of those front panel connectors. Although I'm probably unlikely to put this motherboard back in this case, but you never know. Okay, now unless I have to remove that drive cage, I should be good to pull the motherboard now. All right, it's looking loose now. 
Oh boy. Now I see rust. Oh yeah, this thing's in a bad state. Even the RAM has corrosion. And it even rusted out the case. Oof. Yeah, that thing sure did its damage. So consider this a public service announcement. If you have old systems and you haven't checked their batteries, go ahead and check them, like, right now. And if they have these barrel-style NICAD batteries, get them out of there immediately. Okay, so let's start by getting rid of that battery. Look at that, even the silk screening came off the board. That is crazy. Okay, well, I'm just gonna go ahead and remove everything that is removable from the board. Oof, that was really stuck. But you know what? That module might be salvageable. Looks like it might have lucked out on this one. Just looks like the edge connector took a little bit of corrosion. And this one might be okay. All right, now let's go ahead and extract that keyboard BIOS. Okay, luckily it didn't eat away any of the pins. Looks like it's just surface corrosion. And let's get the BIOS out of there. Looks like it has survived. Now I'll go ahead and get the cache chips out of there. And finally, CPU. All right, all the pins look good. And here's a look at the underside of the board beneath the battery. And we've definitely got some trace repairs to do. Yeah, that trace is almost completely gone. I think that one is completely gone. I'm not hitting any copper. Okay, now I have to neutralize the electrolyte. And all I'm going to use for that is some white vinegar mixed with some distilled water at about 20% concentration. And I'll do the same thing for the other side of the board. And I'm just going to let it work its magic for a few minutes. And I'll do the same thing for the RAM modules, although I'm not going to be nearly as heartbroken if I can't save these as I will be over the motherboard. Okay, well, I can at least clean up the pins on the keyboard BIOS. Yeah, there are several fine traces that are just gone. Like there is no copper left there. Okay, so now I'm just going to go ahead and give the board a good wash and a thorough rinse with distilled water and then start desoldering some components. Okay, now I need to depopulate several components, including the keyboard connector, socket for the keyboard BIOS, and this ISA slot, and all of the little passive components in between, and possibly this SIM slot. All right, I better get to desoldering. Okay, yeah, this board needs some extensive trace repair. That's definitely beyond the scope of this video, especially since I'm going to have to order parts. I don't think I'm going to be able to save this ISA slot. It's just too heavily corroded. And the board would work fine without it. You just have that one less 8-bit ISA slot. I also don't have any of the 40-pin dip sockets on hand, so I'm going to have to order some. And I did notice that this little retaining clip broke off of this RAM slot, but that shouldn't be a big deal. I should be able to fix that with some epoxy or something. Some of these other ones are pretty close to breaking too. This is just really brittle plastic, as plastic tends to get as it ages. But this board and the board from the second system will definitely be making a reappearance on this channel once I get all the parts in, and we'll do some good old circuit board repair. Rest easy, old boy. We'll get you fixed up soon. Okay, well, let's give that power supply a test. I am fairly confident we're going to get a smoke show out of this one. But let's see. Okay, that is amazing. As rough a shape as this thing's in, and that fan spun right up. Though we are a little bit high on the 5 volt rail, and the 12 volt rail is just a little bit low. Minus 5 is pretty reasonable, but minus 12 is pretty far off, so we will not be using this power supply. Alright, let's go ahead and get that face plate off, because I'm going to give it a bath. I've already removed all the screws. 
Oh, that is so nasty. Just a half inch thick dust bunny at the bottom. Hey, it looks a little better. Okay, well we can at least test the rest of the components from this system. And for that I'm going to enlist the help of the Baby AT486 that I found in the garbage a couple weeks ago. This system is very similar hardware-wise to the motherboard that was in this ill-fated system. But before I do that I'm just going to spruce up this floppy drive a little bit, because it is filthy. Let's just give it a quick de-dusting with an anti-static brush. Now let's get this grime off here. Okay, well, it's better than it was at least. I'm not going to worry too hard about this drive because there are better five and a quarter inch drives in this collection. Now let's get this plate off to clean the heads. Well, the dust sure runs deep in this thing. Look at that. Oh, that is disgusting. But wait, there's more. Alright, let's clean up those heads. Yep, pretty dirty. Now let's get the upper head. Okay, that one wasn't too bad. Okay, that's as clean as this thing's getting without a major teardown. Okay, well before I put precious hardware at risk, let's just do a quick dry fire test of everything. Power on. Oh, that hard drive is angry. And that makes me incredibly sad because that is an old drive. And I bet it makes some deliciously crunchy sounds. Okay, well let's just try that again. Maybe that hard drive will unstick itself. Okay, well actually it sounds like it initialized that time. That hard drive might be good. Alright, I'm just going to connect that other PCI power adapter just to shut that tester up. That's the only reason it's beeping. Okay, let's see if the CD drive opens. It opens very slowly, but hey, at least it opens. Alright, well nothing's drawing down the voltage too bad, so I think we're good. Okay, well, looks like a mess, but I've got everything connected. I've got the video card and the I.O. board from that ill-fated system in here, so let's see what it does. Hey, yeah, got a post. And a floppy drive seek. And it's booting. Something. Huh, <laughs> what? Windows 95? They had Windows 95 on that thing? Okay. Angry about something. Continue. What? I cannot believe they had Windows 95 on this thing. More anger. It's angry because I didn't put that ISA nick back in. Boy, is it ever angry. Keep going. Okay, we may not be getting much further. Okay, yeah, not getting any further. There might just be far too many hardware differences for old Windows 95 to cope with. Let's just try to reboot. Okay, it wants to go in the safe mode because it was an improper shutdown. Let's try normal first. All right, I guess we're not getting into Windows 95. Let's try a DOS boot disk. And it doesn't boot to floppy. Well, you know what? Let's try safe mode. Let's see how safe it really is. You know, I don't even have a way to connect the mouse to this thing. I'm gonna have to get a serial mouse. Okay, well, I made it in the safe mode. Let me go get a serial mouse. Okay, well, I got serial mouse connected, but it's not working. I don't even know if this mouse works at all. And it's my only serial mouse. So, we'll just continue with keyboard shortcuts. Okay. Look at that. That hard drive works. And it doesn't sound angry at all. And it has some beautiful clicky sounds. Let's see, let's get in my computer. I think we just froze. Nope, there we go. That was weird. Alright, let's see what this drive got on it. Looks like all business. Don't see any games. No surprise, because it didn't have a sound card. Wow, it's got PKWare on it. PK Unzip. 
the original. Let's see, let's try that floppy drive again. Okay, yeah, that floppy drive's not working. And I don't see the five and a quarter inch drive, but that's because I didn't enable it in the CMOS. Let's try to get into DOS mode. Oh, can't do that in safe mode. Okay, well, let's just reboot. All right, let's go to command prompt only. There we go. Let's see if the thing has scan disk on it. I'm gonna have to take a look at this drive. Okay, let's go ahead and save those. Maybe this is the reason why it won't boot. Skip undo. This thing's got all kinds of issues. Fix it. Keep fixing it. Oh, I remember this. You had to hit this for every single problem. Yes, keep fixing it. All right, yeah, let's do a surface scan. Man, this thing needs a defrag. See if we got any bad sectors. All right, we didn't find any bad sectors. I am incredibly happy about that. This little hard drive is a survivor. All right, well, let's see if Windows 95 boots after all those file system fixes. And nope, we still got that same hang at the same spot. But you know what, that's okay, because we just confirmed that this drive is perfectly healthy. Now let's get into the CMOS settings and enable that five and a quarter inch drive. Okay, well, serial mouse works in the BIOS. Floppy drive B. I'm not even sure what size that is. I'm assuming it's probably gonna be a 1.2. I didn't check any of the labels. Okay. Save changes and exit. And we got a seek on the B drive. It's gonna insert a sacrificial five and a quarter inch floppy disk, and then let's try to format it. Okay, that's not happy. Try again, let me watch the spindle. And spindle's not turning. Yeah, that spindle feels pretty stuck. A lot of resistance. Let's see, it wants to turn. Oh, there we go. I think I just unstuck it. Let's try again. Hey, there it goes. And it is formatting. Although, I'm pretty sure it's gonna fail because that's a double density disk and I'm trying to format it for 1.2 megabytes, which is probably not gonna work. Okay, yeah, there it goes. That's actually normal when you try to format a double density disk with this capacity. But at least it's trying. It makes some terrible sounds. But hey, it's a good workout for the head motor. But you know, it's progressively sounding better and better, so this is really a good workout for it. Well, it made a valiant effort. <laughs> Mostly bad sectors. Nice. Oh, well, actually, let's try formatting it again with the correct capacity. All right, got to specify the drive. Doi. All right, well, that went better. Yeah. Now let's try copying some files to that thing. Let's see what we got on here. Oh, Lord. Okay, let's just try copying these chk files. And it's copying. All right, well, we've got 12 of them on there. Let's see. Yeah, they made it. All right, well that drive works. So I guess it probably is worth taking apart and cleaning up. Okay, well, last thing to check is this CD drive. Okay, well. Sounds kind of happy. Now I don't know whether it loaded the driver, so I don't know what the drive layer might be. So let's try D drive, hmm, maybe. Ooh, that thing sounds mad. Okay, well that's definitely the right drive letter. But that drive is not having a good time. Okay, well let's just try one more time. Nope, sounds like the spindle is stuck on this drive also. But I bet the laser works because it did try to spin up. Okay, well, we're two for four for these drives, but you know what? That's okay because 
The two drives that I really wanted to work do in fact work. And after giving it some exercise, the opening and closing mechanism is working just fine on this drive. All right, moving on to the next system. This faceplate is also remarkably free of yellowing. And it has the two digit seven segment display. Got the turbo button and the reset button. Weirdly enough, that reset button sticks in there. That's not supposed to do that. Looks like it's got to punch out for a keyboard connector or something. Okay, well, despite the deceptive weight of the thing, there is actually no motherboard in here. But at least we do have a power supply. But we do have a bit of provenance here. Looks like this machine was originally sold in 1990. I'm guessing that's November 19th, although that's a weird way to write the date. Well, let's open it up and see what it does have inside. Okay, clearly this thing was home to some kind of rodent. I'm gonna put on some gloves for this one. Okay, well, let's get that floppy drive disconnected. Okay, luckily I don't see any nibbling on the cable. Right, got a drive bay cover here. And so far I don't see any nibbling on the cables. What on earth is this thing? Oh, uh, you know what? This must be uh, for connecting to the keyboard port. Yeah, it runs to that front keyboard punch out thing. It's interesting that that's there and was never punched out. All right, well, let's clean this thing out at least. Okay, well, let's test out that power supply, why not? All right, well, it spins right up. I'm having some crazy luck with power supplies. Kind of disappointing, I want to see some smoke. Sacrificial hard drive's doing its thing. But we are quite low on the 12 volt rail and just a little bit high on the 5 volt rail and quite low on the minus 12 volt rail and then also low on the minus 5 volt rail. All right, so this power supply probably isn't very healthy. Well, found the rodent damage. Okay, well, let's see if the little display works. And there it goes. And why is it set to 08? I guess somebody never bothered to set it. And of course, with no motherboard, not going to get the digit switching. But hey, it works. Okay, well, let's see if that floppy drive works. Got the baby AT486 at our service once more. Power on. Well, it doesn't sound like the heads are moving. And yeah, failed to boot. You know what? I'm gonna pop that thing open and see what's going on inside. And yeah, we got no head movement. Let's just see if it's mechanically stuck. Well, motor turns. Let's see if it goes back to the end of the disc. Well, it does that. All right, let's try the simplest thing first. Let's clean the heads. Well, not very dirty. All right, let's try now. Nope. Oh well, not the worst that can happen. We've got plenty of floppy drives. Okay, well, on to our final system. I can already tell this one is completely empty. It doesn't even have a power supply. But once again, I'm impressed by the lack of yellowing. This case is in really good condition. And just look at it compared to my 486. Just goes to show it's all about the environment that these things were stored in. And not a whole lot to see around the back, but we do have a sticker. We got a date of sale of 12-25-1998. This might have been somebody's Christmas present. Looks like it originally had a Pentium 1, 120 megahertz with 32 megs of RAM, and a 1.6 gigabyte hard drive, and a 32 speed CD-ROM. But let's go ahead and open this thing up anyway. Okay, well, apart from a dust bunny and some surface rust, it's actually pretty clean in here. Okay, well, let's test that little display. And it works. And actually, now I got plenty of access, I can show you how we change the digits. All we need to do is adjust the jumpers on the back, and the jumpers just turn on and off the different segments. In these cases, used to come with a little booklet to show you which jumper configurations led to which digits. I don't know what that is, backwards nine or something. But without that booklet, it's all trial and error. And with this case being empty, you can get a better look at the jumper block on the back. I just want to give a huge thanks to everyone who's subscribed, and an especially huge thanks to everyone who's pledged their support on Patreon. And if you're new to the channel and you like this kind of content, I'm doing stuff like this all the time, so be sure to subscribe. But that's all for this video. Thanks for watching.